Tabas One, from slick designs to zero emissions, electric vehicles are reshaping mobility globally. Nigeria stands at a crossroad. Can EVs revolutionize its transportation system? Or will existing challenges prove insurmountable? To unpack this, I am joined by Dr. Sam Benga Faleye, CEO, Saglev Electromobility Co. Thank you for joining me, Doctor. For having me. All right. Well, there is no doubt that EVs are making inroads into Africa's largest economy, Nigeria, that is, with some companies boasting of designing and manufacturing the same locally. However, I would like you to speak to the current state of EVs in Nigeria across all value chains. So um, electric vehicles are relatively new to Nigeria. People have used EVs here for a while, but I want to say that we're at an age where remarkable changes such as removal of the uh, fuel subsidy is making people understand the absolute importance of electric vehicles as one of our solutions without a doubt. So EVs are showing up. Uh, we ourselves are building a, an electric uh, vehicle assembly plant, the very first one uh, that strictly focuses on assembling electric vehicles in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we are building this with a capacity of 2,500 to 10,000 cars a year. So electric vehicles are here, as I always say, the future is here, and uh, these vehicles are much more possible than people uh, would imagine. So, um, yeah, so electric vehicles are here, and they are very viable. I personally have been driving electric vehicles in Lagos for at least over a year, so this, this is very viable. Well, apart from what Saglev is doing, with more calls for the decarbonization of you know, transport, what are the prospects for EVs in Nigeria? I mean, I'm looking at all across all value chains, and I also want to see how investors are taking this up. Are they seeing the value, and are they responding accordingly, as much as you think they should? Well, uh, we will call ourselves uh, trailblazers because we personally are fully 100% self-funded, but we are receiving a lot of investor interest. So uh, primarily, uh, just a few facts. Uh, the average uh, 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 ride-hailing driver who is uh, using a, the smallest uh, known vehicle is spending anywhere 10, 11,000 naira a day on petrol. Uh, with us, it's only going to be 2,500 naira. So people are going to start getting aware of this. Uh, most people can actually charge the vehicle in their car and only need, if they're driving within the city, only need to charge the car probably no more than once, maybe twice a week, probably even three times a week for some of our vehicles uh, that go up to 500 kilometers. So uh, people are starting to realize what electric vehicles represent. Uh, people don't want to spend their entire life savings on uh, uh, PMS or petrol. So uh, people are starting to realize, and this is viable. Uh, you know, we are happy that there's a lot of timing. We've been waiting quietly for three to four, five years, uh, and that uh, the timing is right, and people, uh, the reception uh, uh, is, uh, ex is, is extremely uh, amazing. I don't think many people are going to buy brand new cars in Nigeria when they have electric vehicle cars available. So this is very viable. Charging, which people think is a problem, has not been any problem at all. All right, well, it's no news that electric cars are more expensive than diesel, petrol, or CNG-powered vehicles. I get your point, you know. But beyond these, are there other factors that make EVs the go-to option for, you know, a random or private user? Perhaps you want to look at the running or the maintenance cost or even the battery range of these vehicles. Yes, so um, if you really look at the modeling, you will find out that while an electric vehicle might be a little bit more expensive, and uh, by the way, we have models that are, more, that are even more affordable than existing new cars in Nigeria. Uh, so when you add the fact that you're not buying petrol, and then the fact that the average electric vehicle will save you 50 to 60 percent in maintenance cost. So, uh, 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 so as a result, by the time you buy an electric vehicle and you look out 11, 12, 13 months, you're already caught up and ahead because you're looking at much less uh, maintenance cost. For example, you don't need an oil change in an electric vehicle. Uh, we have a little lubricant that we change once every 12 years. Uh, in, so we're really talking about a battery and an electric motor. Uh, you don't even have a transmission. You don't have all those parts that would be, you know, break down. So uh, uh, we, we feel that as people begin to learn, they'll understand. But yeah, so this issue of cost, you might have a slightly uh, a higher cost uh, 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 getting in 
under normal circumstances, what is interesting now is that because of the way the, the um, uh, um, exchange rate has, has really ballooned in Nigeria, we are now beginning to beat some internal combustion vehicle uh, uh, similar brands uh, by not even 5, 10, 10 million naira in some cases. So it, it's just a very uh, a stupendous situation that we never anticipated. But um, uh, basically, we can really go out there and tell people that we are not only better off on the long term now, even on the short term, uh, we, we are actually better off. But when you look at uh, markets like the US and Europe, one of the things we see is that though the sales of EV peaked last year, 2023, but then coming to 2024, there has been this slight decline. And we're saying that, you know, these cars are staying longer in the lots and, you know, nobody's probably picking them up or few persons are picking them up. Even Tesla has reduced prices and that is, is still not helping inventory. So talk to us, looking at um, what's happening globally and also the Nigerian situation, do you think prices are the only thing holding EV buyers back, or are there other things? I know you've tried to clarify and talk about how that in the long run, even in the short, short term, that buying EVs are better, but I would like you to clarify this. Okay, so um, the story in the United States, particularly not even in Europe, is that in the United States, uh, the adoption is, looks like when you're looking from the outside that the adoption is slow, but you have to understand that the average American-made electric vehicle is very expensive. Uh, uh, the cost of labor in America is very expensive. Uh, so uh, I can tell you that the comparable vehicle from Asia is going to cost probably 40% less. And we are experiencing this in our own. We are an American market, and we chose to not, for now, start business in America, but start in the in the. Uh, the rest of the world and move back to America. Uh, so the center of gravity for electric vehicles right now is in Asia. It is not in Britain, it's not in, uh, uh, it's not in Germany, it's not in Italy, uh, unlike internal combustion cars. So uh, America is at a very, uh, a very disadvantaged cost, you know, uh, co cost situation. Give me an example. If a Tesla battery goes out, Tesla is not even going to bother repairing that battery. They will recycle it into the home energy solutions. That is because it's much cheaper for them to replace that battery. Because the cost of labor, the guy who is going to do that work, is earning sometimes $60, $70, $80 an hour. So it's easier for Tesla to simply change that, change that battery. Uh, so these are some of the things that is affecting the U.S. market. But you know, uh, you know, whatever the reason is, the, 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 the market in America is uh, very unique. It's actually a very expensive EV market. And as such, people are able to, don't forget that people can still afford to pay for uh, uh, gasoline in the United States. And now they are thinking, well, this is going to save me money down the line, but is it saving me money right now? And uh, if you're looking at leasing a car for two years, uh, you know, the cost of petrol is not an issue, frankly speaking, Gasoline is much cheaper in the United States compared to Ghana, Nigeria. It's just much cheaper. So these are some of the factors. And again, you know, there are some political issues. All the guys that have in, invested billions of dollars making internal combustion vehicles, uh, they want to sell these vehicles. So there is All this right. issue. Uh, you know, so there are many reasons. However, in Nigeria, uh, we have, uh, we, first of all, we have a need. And this is the easiest way for us to achieve mobility at an affordable rate is electric vehicle bar none. All right. I like what you said now, saying that it's a need, because at some point uh, during the course of this conversation, I intend to ask if it's a need or just some other things. But then elsewhere, we've seen exponential growth in the sale of electric vehicles. And we've also seen wider module availability, increased performance and improved range. But we do not see that yet in emerging and developing economies as sales have not you know, been that exponential. Is this something to be concerned about? And what do you think is responsible for this? Should we be concerned or what do you think is responsible for this? Well, uh, if I understand you asking me about the sales for electric vehicles, honestly speaking, we have to look at that very carefully. Um, the sales of electric vehicles, if electric vehicles are being sold at this rate, in about 20 to 30 years, you are act actually 15 years, you are going to actually have more sales of electric vehicles than internal combustion engine vehicles. This is how fast 
electric vehicles are being sold. Let me give you an example, China. There are more Teslas being bought in China today than anywhere else in the world. There are more Teslas being made in China than any other place in the world. We're already talking about three, four million electric vehicles a year. And now the adoption is going worldwide. So we have to parse these numbers carefully Dr. Falaye, I'd I'll, I'll like us to focus more on Africa, actually. That, that's the context of this conversation. If we could just, you know, uh, narrow it down to Africa. Okay, so the African context, absolutely. Electric vehicles are new here. You have to understand we are coming from a situation where, yes, you know, our earning power is less. But I can assure you, just judging by the number of orders, the number of interest, the amount of uh, people, amount of as a percentage of personal income people have to spend on, on uh, petrol, the sales here are going to be remarkable. So let us give it two, three, four months. We personally start assembling vehicles in, in, in April and the kind of response, the kind of interest we are already seeing, frankly, is bothersome because we are proud to say, well, we are assembling the vehicles here. We have a okay, plan. Let's, let's, let's um, anchor here now. Let me ask you this simple one, and then we'll close on this. Now, what do you think will get the government interested in supporting EVs in Nigeria, as we see elsewhere, you know, where governments are giving incentives and even tax breaks? What are the things or the factors that will facilitate, you know, the uptake or adoption of EVs in Nigeria in the quantity that you are looking to or looking at? Okay, so I cannot say that the government is not interested. The policy is there, has been there. The most recent National Automotive Industry Development Plan uh, that was uh, for 2023 clearly shows that they have policy. Now, we find ourselves in some fiscal difficulty that doesn't necessarily make it easy. So the government is, is uh, definitely interested. However, what's going to make the government more interested is for them to see that these EVs are possible. These EVs can save money. Then even their uh, uh, MDAs will be using EVs. So that, that's going to be impo imp important. Now, you have to have a fiscal, uh, 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 a fiscal situation where you can now give incentives. Uh, government is already giving incentives to manufacturers like myself. I have to be honest. We can't blame the government for everything. They are giving incentives. The government understands to boost manufacturing. They have to make import duties and all that, uh, uh, you know, lower. The problem is the process to even get that import duty okay. is where the, the pain is. But the government is interested. We've got to be honest. I'm not going to criticize the government unnecessarily. But, right. you know, they need to see that these things are working. And very soon, the government is going to see. I already told you that once we can get drivers into an EV, what actually happens is, the driver himself has a better income because they spend less on power. And you know it is the driver that pays for gas. Thank and you so are, much, Dr. Sam yeah. uh, Faleya, for sharing your thoughts with us on the show today. Thank you so much. I appreciate being allowed to come and uh, speak to you about this. All right. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we have more for you. Stay with us. According to Reuters poll of equity strategists, the recent global stock rally is expected to have only a little further to go, with analysts evenly split on the likelihood of a correction in the next three months. The rally, which began in late 2023, has propelled many indices close to lifetime highs, driven by strong earnings and booming tech stocks. The poll of around 150 equity analysts showed that all 15 major stock bosses surveyed were expected to rise this year with only three expected to gain more than 10%. Analysts are divided on the possibility of a correction in the next three months, with some expressing concerns about the potential impact of higher interest rates and increased investor positioning. Despite this, a majority of analysts expect corporate earnings to increase over the next six months.
The U.S. and China are in discussions to prevent a wave of emerging market sovereign defaults, marking a significant attempt at economic cooperation between the rival superpowers. The talks aim to preemptively extend loan periods before countries miss payments, easing the annual debt service burden for poor nations and addressing high borrowing rates. Ideas under consideration include extending repayment times and increasing financing from multilateral banks. Any joint proposal between the U.S. and China would require support from the G20, IMF and World Bank. The U.S. Treasury Department and China's Minister of Finance and Minister of Foreign Affairs have not confirmed the specifics of the discussions. The talks began before a meeting between Presidents Joe Biden and Xi Jinping and have continued into 2024. Finally, oil prices fell on Friday as a U.S. Fed official suggested delaying interest rate cuts for at least two more months, leading to a decline in Brent crude futures by 38 cents to $83.29 per barrel and U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures by 40 cents to $78.21. Federal Governor Christopher Waller's recommendation to postpone rate cuts aimed to evaluate a recent inflation increase, which could impact economic growth and oil demand. Despite this, analysts observed healthy demand, with U.S. crude oil inventories rising less than expected and refinery run rates reversing a declining trend. J.P. Morgan's data indicated a month-over-month -month rise in oil demand driven by increased travel in China and Europe. For that offering today on Business Edge, many thanks for watching. I am Perpetua Fasome Peter. To enjoy the rest of the day. Bye for now.